Okay, hello everyone. Welcome again to the Medical Missionary Podcast. I am glad to tell you that I have Dr. Eric Walsh again, um, and this is more or less a continuation of the first time that we 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 made uh, the first episode. So, Dr. Walsh, once again, thank you for blessing us with your presence. Um, Dr. Walsh, I want to just jump straight into. There is a statement we have from Ellen White, which says nine tenths of diseases stem from the mind. Now, can you break that down a little bit for us? Because it gets thrown around a lot, but in a practical perspective, like what's, what's, what's the mind got to do with, with sickness? And at the same time, um, what things out there in our day-to-day lives are actually maybe harming our mind or have potential to impact us and lead us to disease? So that statement is a very powerful statement. And when people challenge Ellen White as a prophet, you know, I think of statements like that because in her time, it would have been difficult for her to know without the spirit leading her the full ramifications of such a statement and how precise that statement actually is. So that is what happens is that we somaticize. Um, and we somaticize meaning when things affect us emotionally and mentally, a lot of times we'll actually push into our bodies um, symptoms. Our body will, our brain will cause our body to have symptoms. Mm. So we stop and pay attention to what is going on with, mentally. Okay. So you start getting pains, aches, even sometimes full-blown diseases. There's a somatization rash that I've seen people get when they're under undue stress. Wow. That is truly just because they're so stressed out and it's their body saying, hey, and their mind telling, through their body telling them, hey, slow down. You know, it's too much. We're overwhelmed. Mm. Um, so let's, so let's step back a step. So really where it comes from is stress. Um, and stress, uh, there's something I call a stress, um, equation that we use uh, Mm -hmm. on our slave food podcast, uh, or YouTube channel, I should say. And it says stress equals demands minus resources. Hmm. So when you get very stressed out, there are three F's of what can happen. Fight, flight, or freeze. Okay. Um, and so... If you are chronically stressed in a bad marriage, at a bad job, in a bad neighborhood. Mm, in school uh, as well? In, in a school being bullied or in a school that's just you know, high demand, get good grades, get good grades, get good grades. That chronic stress means that the fight or flight system, that um, cortisol-based, adrenaline-based system is always on. Mm. Well, what does that system do? Well, that system, in order to make you better able to fi- fight or flee... Um, and if overloaded, you freeze, <laughs> but fight or flee, it constricts your blood vessels hmm. so that your blood pressure is higher, especially in the carotids and in the neck, so that you get more blood flow to the brain. Okay. okay. It shunts blood away from your digestive tract to your big muscles so you can fight or flee. Um, it increases your heart rate. It increases your respiratory rate. Um, it actually takes blood away from your skin so that if you're mauled by an animal in your fight or flight stress encounter, you bleed less. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's, it's quite profound. Your pupils dilate. They don't constrict. Your liver goes into a process of gluconeogenesis to give you the energy to be able to fight or flee. It starts to make sugar. All of that sounds great, except it's supposed to be on and off in a, in a, you know, in a short period of time. Mm. You're chronically stressed, all of these things stay on. Well, what happens now if your blood vessels always are tense and, and constricted? You have high blood pressure, um, you're sending more blood to your brain than it needs. You can actually have a, st- a hemorrhagic stroke, even an ischemic stroke, based on how that happens. Okay. Your heart is going to be overworked because the heart rate's always high, um, and the vessels are constricting that lead the blood to your heart. Um, uh, the, your liver's making sugar. Well, if your liver's making sugar, you don't need the sugar. Mm. Um, you can become in- insulin insensitive because you always have this higher level of sugar than you're supposed to, which can lead to diabetes. Well, if, when you're stressed out, you know, if you think of, you know, a lion is going to get you or something, or a dog. Um, you're also, one of the other things you're not going to do um, in that time is that your body's not going to prioritize your immune system. So hmm. that means you're going to be more likely to get infections, mm-hmm. and you're also going to be more likely to get um, cancer because cancer is checked by your immune system. So fear literally makes you sick. Stress wow. literally makes you stre- sick. But that all happens in the mind. So if the mind is not right, if you're overly anxious, overly sensitive, um, your perception is that you're always in danger when you're not, mm-hmm. um, 
you know, or again, or you're in a bad relationship, which is emotional and mental, all of these things will co come together to create disease. And there's one other really fascinating way that it does. So all of that will give you symptoms, all of that will make you sick, just as Ellen White said. Okay, okay. Um, but the other one is that there's a nutritionist who says, stressed is desserts spelled backwards. <laughs> and we have a slide on that that we show when we do our talks. Um, and what that means is that when you are in this fight or flight state, and you're overstressed with cortisol, adrenaline, and all these things are going on, and you you have a choice between an apple and a brownie mm. full of fat and sugar. Okay, okay. Which one of them is going to make you feel better? In the moment, mm -hmm. for most of us, the f the f the highly calorie dense. Fatty food is going to make the brain think we're getting energy, we're getting resources, the taste is going to send dopamine surging in your brain, mm -hmm. change, will help to make you feel like you might change your mood or you will change your mood. And so those foods become more attractive. Mm -hmm. So again, so let's go back to the medical hmm. missionary and evangelist and talk about why it's not that simple as going and say, hey, stop eating, you know, hostess fudge brownies and switch to eating, you know, apples. Okay. It's not that simple because... What is driving them to eat that brownie is sometimes different than even willpower hmm. can control. In other words, they're eating that brownie because they're so stressed that it is what makes them feel better. And anything that changes the mood can become habit-forming and even addicting. Mm. That's why one of the ways food can become addicting, even before you get to the fact that the food industry is designing the food to be addictive, to increase profits, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the mind is in control but the mind is susceptible to all of those things. And in its own panic, and one other thing I didn't mention is that the neurotransmitters in the brain, like serotonin, which keeps you calm, mm -hmm. makes you feel satisfied. Its precursor is tryptophan, the amino acid, which you get in food. If you eat turkey, they say, oh, there's a ton of tryptophan, but there's also a ton of every other amino acid. They compete, so you actually <laughs> don't get the good boost that you do with a whole food plant-based diet where the tryptophan gets priority to get into your brain. Okay. Because once the tryptophan is in your brain, it is the precursor to make the chemical, serot the, the neurotransmitter, serotonin. Serotonin, okay. serotonin okay. is the chemical that is depleted when you're stressed long-term. So you become more mm. anxious and depressed. It is the chemical that we treat uh, depression and anxiety with drugs like Prozac. Because Prozac is a part of a family of drugs called the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. Okay, okay. And those okay. serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, we call them SSRIs, work to keep serotonin in the nerve synapse between the pre and post um, synaptic um, nerve sheets. And it, and it does that so that you'll feel better. Mm -hmm. But if you don't eat right because you're stressed, mm -hmm. there's a cascade of events. The stress on the one hand is, is depleting your ser serotonin directly, but then you have this, you have this alternate circuit of what you because you're eating bad, it's depleting your serotonin. Well, here's where it gets really bad. Now, when your serotonin levels drop low, serotonin is a precursor on the way to making melatonin, oh. and melatonin is what helps you sleep. Yes. So now you're stressed, you're not eating well, and you can't sleep, and you're not sleeping well. Mm. So all of that is the mind, which is why Ellen White's comment is so profound. Um, and in order to break that, while well, we're on it, well, in order to break that, mm -hmm. one, the mind has to be stirred in the right place. Stress management tips and those things. Relationships have to be checked. A lot of times this is a, the product of a bad relationship. Past failures, um, hmm. past traumas. Some folk have never forgiven. God has forgiven them. God is willing, I should say, to forgive them of their sins, but they have not forgiven themselves from the mistakes that they've made. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of that comes together. Mm -hmm. And as you look at that... Um, there are neurotransmitters in the brain like serotonin, dopamine, GABA. And there are some, serotonin, I think, has more receptors in your gut than in your brain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or it is plenteous in your gut. And so you can actually feel some things because of the mind-gut connection. Mm -hmm. And that's another way that this, the mind can affect you because you, you, it's almost like you have a second brain, some argue, between the gut microflora and the, uh, of the bacteria in the lower gut, but also of these neurotransmitters in the gut. They don't really connect, but there's some there's a lot of science still developing. Mm -hmm. And it may turn out that when we eat and how we feel, why we feel queasy in our stomach when we get stressed out, is all is all more connected than we realize. Mm -hmm. Um and that's why we get some of these things and the mind is so important. Okay. So would would that also tie in with why there's a lot of like gut issues now, especially when people are so stressed. We're getting a lot of, you know, the IBS and some of these issues too that come up. 
I think absolutely. I think stress is a part of it. I also think bad diet is a part of it. Okay. When you eat a bad diet, one of the things that happens is you um, mm. destroy the good gut micro uh, flora, the bacteria that's supposed to be there, and you're putting in harmful bacteria, mm -hmm. and harmful bacteria break down the um, the um, the colon blood barrier, like to, to go through. You know, so the toxins now can seep into your colon. Um, it destroys, can destroy the lining of the colon. And it can become precancerous to cancerous, causing mm. colon cancer. And all of that, it, it, the irony is it all ties not, you know, it, the mind is still connected because of how we eat and how we feel in, in the gut yeah. like, based on, um, you know, the stressors and so forth that are going on around us. Okay, okay. So how then, now since, since you touch on that, because stress affects everybody, whether, and especially, dare I say, even medical missionaries, find themselves among some of the most stressed out people out there. Mm -hmm. So how are we as God's children supposed to be dealing with stress in a healthy way? So this is where a relationship with Christ is important. Daily Bible study, multiple sessions of prayer during the day, remembering that I can leave things at the foot of the cross. Mm -hmm. The more I trust him, one of the reasons, and probably the most important, I did my, I just did a, a series, you can go on audio verse and hear it, on, the, on New Start. And I did each one. I drilled deep into each aspect from the medical literature and explaining why each of these things are so important. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I started backwards with the last T and I went backwards. Because to me, when you preach the, the health message to the church, you should start backwards. That's right. Trust in God trust. is the most important thing. Mm. So how do you deal with the stress? You trust in God. You know your limits and you set boundaries. Right? Mm. Even in the Bible, when Moses was trying to do too much, his father-in-law came to him and was like, dude, you need to set up some people under you to, to absorb some of this. And some of us think, well, I'm doing God's work. I'm doing God's work. But if you're doing God's work and it's killing you, you're not, one, you're not doing God's work well. And two, you're not going to be doing God's work for long. That's right. So you want to <laughs> step back. Even Ellen White, when you really look at her life, there were times of retreat, times of repose when she, you know, mm. she stopped and looked at things. And the Sabbath sometimes isn't the best direct way to do it because some of us are busier on the Sabbath preaching and doing things. So you've got to make sure that you're, you've set aside time on the Sabbath for spiritual rest. And I'm not talking about sleep, even though you need sleep. I'm talking about time to step back from everyone else and just contemplate nature, study a Bible, mm. an hour, two, three, four hours where you can do that early in the morning, late and later in, in the evening, whatever it is. The second thing is if you're going to be a medical missionary and handle stress, you've got to have good people around you. Okay. Okay. In Jamaica, you know, we say, if you lay with dog, your eyes would flee. <laughs> if you lay down with dogs, you're going to rise up with fleas. So if, you mm -hmm. ride, if you're, ha you're hanging around people who don't handle stress well or aren't supportive of you, they're jealous, they're you know, giving you bad advice, you, you know, you're only going to make your situation worse. In a multitude of counselors, the Bible says there's safety. Mm -hmm. That predisposes that those counselors are Christians, that they're godly. That's right. Um, you see what happened to Job when his friends came around. You've got to have the kind of people that come around you that are going to lift you up, buoy you up, and help you deal with your stresses and help take things off your plate, not add to it. Mm. Um, the third one is the familial relationships. One of the worst things that stresses out medical missionaries and everyone else, but I'll put this on the medical missionaries, is that sometimes you can make some bad decisions around romantic relationships even. Okay. So you've got to be really wise as to who you let into so close into your life. Mm. You know, Even Jesus had an inner circle and he didn't have multiple inner circles. It wasn't like he had 50 disciples on the side somewhere else. <laughs> he had his core team that yes. he built his relationship with, that he developed to go out in the world and preach the gospel. And you've got to have the same kind of mentality. Everybody can't be in your inner circle. Um, and then the other part of it is the lifestyles that you preach, you got to practice. Good mm. food, sleep, hydration, um, um, exercise. Exercise, one of the, exercise is the most underused anti-anxiety medication. And food is the most overused antidepressant. So mm. you've mm. got to make it up in your mind that you're going to use exercise to deal with your stress and get into a very healthy exercise regime because it, exercise is one of the few things that can actually regenerate nerve cells in your brain. It is powerful. Sleep is when actual therapy, natural therapy happens. So, you know, we say go to a therapist. Yeah. The studies are beginning to show that when you sleep, if you get enough sleep and quality sleep, your brain actually works through the pains of the emotional things that you've been through. Hmm. And one of the reasons so many people aren't there, in my opinion, so many people need therapy, and they do. Many of them need the therapy, or they're on even anti-anxiolytics or depressants. 
um, is because they're not getting sleep. And they're not getting sleep because they're caffeinated. They're not getting mm. sleep because they're stressed. And so sleep is your best friend. It will allow you to go to bed and wake up with a clear mind. And that's like it says, you know, let me sleep on it. The yeah. studies show that you literally sleep on it. Your mind actually works through the scenarios, tries to figure out a solution for you. It's not mm. a coincidence that many of the Bible prophecies, the people wake up out of their sleep and then God is dealing with them. Something mm. special about sleep that allows the brain to be influenced by God. And so as a Christian, if you're praying before you go to bed and studying your Bible, those Bible verses will rattle around in your head with your problem as God begins to show you, no, I'm in control. Helps you to realize, no, that was painful, but don't worry, it's behind you. Mm. That happens when we sleep. Amen. So the medical missionary has to practice these lifestyle things if they're going to do well. Amen. Amen. Now, I also want to segue into, since, you know, we started with this issue of the mind, and I know in one of your talks that you did, you know, in Wildwood, you touched on things like music. You touched on things like marijuana, which is which is being legalized in, in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And of course, as we deal with people now, inevitably, some of those people are actually taking some of these things. So why is music such a big deal? Music is a big deal because music can do a lot for you or against you. And if we had time, I'd throw in television and Social media. The Surgeon mm -hmm. General last week or the week before just announced that social media is ruinous to children. Wow. Similar statement that he made about the, the same office of the Surgeon General made about cigarettes back in the 1970s. Hmm. So they literally have just elevated social media to being like a pathogen. Wow. Um, wow. So that's one thing. So we don't have time to get into that except that social media is actually very much not good for you, mm -hmm. um, especially children. Um, but the other piece of it is um, music, in a sense, it bypasses the frontal lobe, meaning you, it, it can come into you and you don't register. And you notice because if you just, someone starts playing music and you don't even know the song, you might tap your foot or move sway a little bit, mm -hmm. even if you don't know the song. Music has a way of influencing you different from the logical, conscious reasoning centers of the brain, primarily in the frontal cortex. Mm -hmm. um, so music then aug augments learning, but music sets a mood, okay. right? Uh, I talked yesterday a bit about how when David, when Saul was, um, Saul had this sp evil spirit in him. Yes. They called David to play the harp and move the evil spirit out of him. Well, if you can move an evil spirit out with music, you have to deduce that you can move a spirit, evil spirit in with music. Yeah, so there are spirit. a lot of people who are sick because they listen to crazy music. I mean, some of the music is really, di you know, really, really disheartening. And the studies show that some of them actually can disrupt heart rhythms and do some pretty crazy things, affect mm. how fast wounds heal, depending on what kind of music you listen to. Oh, wow. So music is really important. Um, and most importantly, remember that Lucifer was the mm. choir director in heaven, and he's mm -hmm. a master at music. And he was trying to set the stage here uh, for us to be lost. Mm -hmm. And he will use music because of the way it works and because of the way it, it, it teaches you things. Wow. Yeah. So is it fair to say then that the role of music is to prepare the way. Like I, th I think of, for example, in church, normally you kind of go through the whole singing before the preacher comes up. Um, it does that okay. directly. So music sets the stage, but music does something else. Think of the score, and for those of you, and I hope you haven't, but for those of you who have ever watched a horror movie, um, I've only watched one or two in my life, and I was a kid, and I was so scared. Uh, to this day, I, I would never watch one. Even mm -hmm. if, <laughs> I don't watch much of anything. <laughs> but I definitely wouldn't watch one of those. I was scared stiff. Um, but the reason I bring up horror movies is they're not scary if you turn off the sound. Hmm, that's if true. If you turn away, that's take true. away the music, mm -hmm. you see a massive difference in how afraid you become. Because the music can move you emotionally to the precipice where when that guy jumps out from behind the door, you scream. Mm -hmm. And you think it's because he jumped outside the door. It is, mm -hmm. but you are emotionally swayed to be ready to jump mm -hmm. by the score, the way it ting, 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 and jaws, you know? And mm -hmm. it, it builds up, you know, something bad's gonna happen. That's what music can do. So it's not just that it leads, it scores. Okay, okay. And so it's behind everything. And so if you're sitting around in your car bumping the latest Jay-Z and Beyonce and all this stuff, that's the score of your life. Hmm. It's changing the very atmosphere of your life. And so, so many young people go to church and they can't stand sitting in church because the spirits that the music has been exposing them to all week is antithetical to the spirit of God who hmm. they will meet when they come into the house of God. Okay, okay. So then maybe can you set this up then for us in a last day events play out? Because I think of, for example, the book of Daniel. In chapter 3, where 
the image was set up, but then music was still used in order to bow down. Absolutely. You nailed it. Though. I mean, it's the same thing. It's the score. So how does Nebuchadnezzar convince these people, who many from all over the world, that mm-hmm. he had captured, who have their own gods? So remember, it wasn't just that the Jews, the Hebrews, weren't supposed to bow, but some of them, their allegiance was to the god where they came from. Yeah. You know, so even though it was a pagan god, they, you know, they weren't supposed to bow to this Babylonian god. In those days, there was a battle of the gods. Every fight was a battle between the gods. So Jehovah was fighting uh, Marduk, you know, their god or whoever. You know, they were fighting the different gods, Ashtaroth. Mm-hmm. They were fighting them. And so when when Israel won, Jehovah won. When Babylon won, his god won. And many of the Jews bowed because in their mind it was like, ah, this god obviously beat Jehovah. I'm going to bow. It was the, it was the he, three Hebrew boys who said, no way am I bowing. Because I know my God can deliver me. That's why they use that terminology. Mm. Because what Nebuchadnezzar is kind of pushing in their face is, your God lost, you bow to mine. Or mm-hmm. bow to the one I've just set up. So they use music to take down that anxiety. Mm. Calm you down and make you not think as much. Music like television, like social media, TikTok and all this stuff, is like a mild hypnotic Wow. Television itself actually changes the brain waves into more of a meditative state where you're less able to process the information coming at you critically. Critically. Mm. Music does the same thing. Wow. Right? So you think about it, you there's a there's a song some kid was pointing out to me and it was it was a, this upbeat bubbly song sound all happy. The lyrics were actually describing them going out and doing a school shooting. Wow. And if you listen to the song, it would take you a long time to make the connection. Because the music was so upbeat and happy for Tina, blah, 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 you know, bumpity bump. I don't know, mm-hmm. but you know what I'm saying? That's the power of music. Mm-hmm. And the reason that's so important is when you come to church, what music is played and listened to is important because we find that sometimes the people writing the contemporary gospel praise music, they're not, they're not actually committed to Christ themselves. Mm-hmm. So the, the lyrics are very vague. You know, it, it you know, and you got to remember in, in Roger Renault's um, book, A Trip into the Supernatural, he talks about when he went to the demon worship, they handed out hymnals. Yeah. And yeah. that they would, instead of saying God's name, they would say curse words or they would curse God from the hymnal. You got to be careful what music you're listening to because the devil is a master of music. Mm. And even in our churches, it's tough. Don't get me wrong. It's a tough battle. Some churches fight over it. But you do want to have make sure that the music is reverent, pointing people to Christ, and that the lyrics are teaching a lesson. Mm. It's not just saying God is wonderful over and over and over. He's so mighty over and over and over again. He's so wonderful over and over. He's so mighty. He's my God. He's my God. Well, That's to have meaning. You could be singing about Lucifer, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Unless you're talking about the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin, victory over sin. You know what I'm saying? You could be talking about any God. Yeah. yeah. And so music is powerful from that perspective. And in these last days, music will be used. Just like it was used in uh, Daniel chapter 3, it will be used in these days, especially around setting up as false gods. You saw that recently at the um, Commonwealth Games. Yes. With that bull that came out. Um, you saw that in Brazil. They showed the videos of the, um, of the, of the Satan beating up the Jesus in the parade. Um, and, wow. the, and the bull that came out there. And the bulls always go back to Baal. If mm-hmm. people don't know that. Mm-hmm. So these bull imagery, is if you read the book, The Return of the Gods, I don't agree with everything in that book, but it makes some excellent points about how this, the spirit of these ancient gods like Baal, Ashtaroth, and Marduk are coming back wow. into modern society. And he shows you how. So mm. music is one of the ways you do that. How do you turn... How do you get people to have sex when they're not, they, you know, we showed, I showed those statistics that kids will start having sex early if they listen to sexually charged music. But if you, if, you know, for those who've ever been to a, out to a party or a nightclub and they start playing slow jams, that's the, mm-hmm. what they call them, and the music is done, everybody gets close, girls, will, even without alcohol or drugs, sometimes people are doing things they would otherwise not do because of the way music sets the mood. Hmm. So you have to be very careful with music. Wow. Okay. So music clearly is one aspect that affects the mind. Can you squeeze in then maybe this issue of marijuana? What's what what's going on with that? Because that's causing a little bit of confusion. Because now you have, even have some Adventists who are saying, "Look, marijuana is also good for dealing with some health issues." Now, is, are there are there medicinal uses for marijuana? There there has to be. Um, you know, almost every plant, if you played with it long enough, you'd probably even poison ivy. You could probably find some 
health use for it <laughs> in some way. <laughs> uh, but when people are like, yeah, marijuana is natural, so it's good for him. Like, well, so is poison ivy, poison sumac, and poison oak. And, you know, you get enough of it, it'll probably actually kill you with the reaction you'd get from it. Mm-hmm. So just because something's natural doesn't mean it's good for you. We live in a world of sin, mm-hmm. and nature's mm-hmm. been distorted. A crocodile is natural. It'll eat you to pieces, <laughs> you know? I mean, so there's some people who are just foolish. Like, if it's natural by default, it must be healthy. Not true. The nature's full of poisonous, deadly things. Um, however, so, and there may be some cases where there are children who you can, you can, marijuana will help them with their seizures. That's 0.0000001% of people in the, in the country, uh, or in the world, you know, very, very small. And even then you could probably extract something out of the marijuana and give it to the kid and not have to have them have the whole plant. Um, you know, so long story short though, the average American, the average person in the world smoking weed, eating edibles, <laughs> they're not treating anything. They're getting high. Um, and here's the problem. We now have um, a cannabis-induced psychotic syndrome where people become um, um, psychotic. They have a psychiatric break. Um, mm. Some have committed suicide um, inadvertently because of it. Um, uh, you have cannabis-induced hyperemesis syndrome now because since the legalization, I've heard only only since they've legalized it in Colorado, I've started hearing some of these terms. Wow. But, and I've seen patients with cannabis-induced hyperemesis syndrome I've seen patients with cannabis and do psychotic breaks as well back in California. Hmm. That was very scary. Wow. Um, and in Miami, I started in medical school. Um, so um, this drug is powerful because it doesn't work like other, other intoxicants. Alcohol, heroin, speed, cocaine all work on the presynaptic nerve front to make you push more dopamine. So you get the pleasure, the euphoria that way. Okay. Marijuana does a little bit of that, but it more so does stuff on the back, on the post synaptic nerve ending changing the receptors that receive the dopamine this is why one reason why it becomes a gateway drug this is also why it it causes a condition called a motivational syndrome when you Mm. smoke weed it takes away your motivation because dopamine now you mess with these receptors dopamine is the chemical in the brain actually gives you drive it doesn't just give you euphoria when you have sex or when you you know take a drug or when you eat you know the dopamine gives you that feeling of euphoria but it also gives you the drive to do better. Mm. It, is a, it, is a, it is an excitatory, um, motivating neurochemical. Okay. So when you mess with the receptors, you take away that piece of it for some people, and you get mot- a motivational syndrome. Mm. The biggest challenge is that it increases the risk of schizophrenia, probably dementia. Um, and so as we've legalized it, over the next 10 years, the number of mental health patients is going to go through the roof. Wow. Um, you're going to have a lot more people with serious mental health problems, schizophrenic type disorders. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to be a real challenge on the American healthcare system. Marijuana is not healthy. The CBD, even the CBD, does some messing with your brain. In general, I don't speak against I've not done enough research on CBD itself, except to say the reason I would not advise it is because the FDA does not oversee marijuana and CBD production and, and products. And unless you know for a fact that that CBD is pure, you're going to get some THC with it, which is the tetrahydrocannabinoid, the THC that causes the, the hallucinations, the psychosis, the emesis, all the things we've been talking about. It's THC that causes all of those things, yeah. the high. Um, and so if you're not careful, you, know, you might get some of that in the CBD. So sometimes, you know, that's why I say I wouldn't mess with any of it right now. Wow. And can you maybe throw in also this aspect you mentioned, you touched on it in your presentation with regards to the strength of the marijuana uh, now compared to, say, in the hippie time, the 60s and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, the way I say it is that the marijuana of today is not the same marijuana Bob Dylan and Bob Marley smoked. Hmm. That was, you know, they, if they had a good strain back then, maybe it was 5%, but on average it was like 3% tetrahydrocannabinoid. We have strains now up to 30%, hmm. 10 times higher. And here's why. Because it's commercialized, that people are competing. If you want to sell a product, you make it more potent. Right? Why, you know, mm. Dunkin' Donuts, Krispy Kreme, and you name another Dunkin', another donut shop, they're competing. So they're going to keep making more and more, you know, palatable, hyper, you know, yeah. hyper not palatable, hyper palatable foods for you to go and eat. Mm-hmm. That is the American food industry. It's the same thing happening in marijuana. And that higher level is really bad for you. I talked about how if you're driving in a car on a highway in some states now, someone will (laughs) drive by you or you drive by them and they're smoking weed. You can smell the weed in your car going 70 miles an hour. You can't smell somebody's cigarette in your car if you're driving 70 miles per hour somebody's smoking cigarettes in their car. But weed, you can. Mm -hmm. That speaks to its potency and its ubiquitous nature now that it's all over society. Wow, wow. 
So this is a crisis in the making. So how do gospel medical missionaries get ready for that? Because they're going to have to deal with it. You have to understand how marijuana works. You have to understand how alcohol works. Because here's the thing. They do a lot of studies and they compare marijuana to alcohol. Okay. But most people are going to smoke weed and drink alcohol. <laughs> you know, I mean, Snoop, <laughs> Snoop Dogg had a song, you know, walking down the street, smoking endo, sipping on gin and juice. He's smoking weed and he's drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. So the studies show that when you do them together, it's even more dangerous. Both of them work on the part of your, uh, on a neurochemical system in your brain um, regulated and by the neurotransmitter GABA. And GABA is the one that gives you like self-control. It's a disinhibiting, uh, it's an inhibiting, sorry, neurochemical. Mm -hmm. So uh, glutamate is the excitatory, GABA is the, so it helps you to kind of stay calm, focused, you know, not just do whatever comes to mind. Alcohol and marijuana deplete that. Hmm. So, you know, that's why drunk people behave the way they do. That's why you go to an alcohol store. I mentioned this yesterday. They say spirit sold here because you are, you become under the influence of the enemy because you, you lose the function of your brain mm. in the frontal cortex, in the part of the front of the brain where um, we've been talking about, where reasoning happens. Going back to one, Isaiah 118, that is where the seal of the living God goes. Yes. Right? So Satan wants to mess up that part of your brain. Marijuana, alcohol, bad mm. food, sex outside of marriage, pornography, all of these things. Um, video games, social media, they're all working here because this is where salvation actually happens. Mm. That's why I can I, I equate it to the most holy place in the temple. If your body's a temple, yes. that's the most holy place because that's where God visits you. That's where the Holy Spirit comes. Like the Shekinah glory of God mm. used to go into the temple. Mm -hmm. All of these things distort it. And, that's what, what it, and what I talk about is they're, what they're teaching you is to open up your mind to psychedelics, to mushrooms, to weed, to marijuana, all of these things, right? Mm-hmm. But the Bible doesn't teach you to open up your mind. Hmm. Ellen White speaks highly against hypnosis. And a lot of this is like chemical hypnosis that's becoming popular now. We as those of us who venture into the medical evangelism, medical missionary work, have to understand what's what now. Because it's going to get very tricky to understand as Eastern religion also is asking people to open up their minds. Meditation. Advent is talking about meditating and doing yoga. Hmm. So you've got to be careful because there's a spiritual front to all of this as well. But God doesn't ask us to open up our mind. In fact, he says he's going to seal you in your mind, mm. meaning he's going to close your mind off and only he's going to have access to it. Yes. Right? And that's the seal of the living God. We often talk about it as being represented by the fourth commandment, but that makes sense. The fourth commandment speaks to God and his authority. That's what that's seals right. your mind. Mm. Um, so, you know, we've got to be very careful. This marijuana uh, epidemic, the alcohol being so rampant, and the Bible, I mean, I was going to read one of the one of the um, verses on alcohol real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who out there who say, you know, a little, you have a little wine for your stomach's sake, or Jesus turned the water into wine. Proverbs 23, 31 says, look not thou upon the wine. When it is red, when it gives his color in the cup, when it moves itself aright, at the last it bites like a serpent and stings like an adder. Hmm. What this is discussing is fermentation and showing you that there was a difference between before the wine fermented and after. After it's firm, he says, don't even look at it, Solomon says. Hmm. When it's red, when it gives its color in the cup, when it moves itself aright. After it is fermented, stay away from it. Why? Because it bites. And how do you know that's what he's talking about? Because grape juice doesn't bite like a serpent and sting like an adder. Yeah, that's right. Grape juice isn't going to call you to, um, he goes on to say, you'll behold strange women. What he's saying is that under the influence of alcohol, a girl that looked like she got hit by a Mack truck, now she looked like <laughs> Vanessa Williams in her prime. Uh -huh. You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And you make stupid, dumb decisions that will ruin your marriage, ruin your relationship with God under the influence of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so anybody's a, a little bit, well, a little bit, when do you begin to lose the ability to make wise decisions? Mm -hmm. It's not when you're fully drunk, mm -hmm. it's when you're tipsy. Yeah. And who? And it doesn't take much alcohol to get you tipsy. I've watched it, I, you know, when I used to go out and stuff. I mean, a beautiful girl come in would never pay you any mind. Two drinks are in her and the girl is all over somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that, it's that they, she's disinhibited and now, you know, and she's not thinking straight. And the spirits now can much more massage her mind and move her in the direction Influence. they want to move her. Wow. Wow. That's a lot to think about. And it's a lot also to, to apply practically yes. and to understand. Now, one last thing. What would you encourage a medical missionary to, to read? What are some of the things that you read and how do you do your research and your study? Because yes. we, we don't want to be ignorant especially as we deal with situations in the world, 
So what are some of the resources that maybe you would say, hey, look, you, you need to... Yes. One of my encouragements to medical missionaries is that the first and most important training happen at places like Wildwood. I wish, if I could go back and do my life again, before I went to college, I'd have come and done a program like this here, then gone to Oakwood, then gone to medical school. Um, these mm -hmm. programs create an amazing spiritual and practical foundation to help people. And you can use it all the way through your career, even before you get trained in anything else. Um, so I'd start there. And then from there, yeah. I would say, this also, as I said earlier, I think I said in the previous episode, you can lay this training on top of anything else. So if you go on to be a nurse, but you know how to do hydrotherapy and massage therapy, how much more powerful of a nurse are you going to be? Mm. If you go on to medicine and become a doctor and you learn these things and how to avoid medication, and you go on to medicine where people come to you looking for help and you have these other tools that you can say, hey, if you're willing to change your life, here are some things that we can do with you to help you change your life. I recommend massage therapy, da 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 da, da. teaching them how to do hydrotherapy at home. You can gain skill sets that you can use practically. But mm. what I do want the medical missionary to understand is that you never stop learning. Mm. Especially because you may not have gotten a lot of the basic sciences or research science that you need to actually be at the cutting edge of where we're finding out how be how beneficial a plant based diet is, or where we're finding out you know how good massaging is for certain conditions, or where we're finding out what's causing disease. Right, that things that you may we, you know now we have proof that this dye and this food causes disease. That helps you in your argument. Hey, you might want to give up the hot Cheetos yeah. or those Doritos because of this red dye in it. So do you want that? Now, what do you read and study then? Well, they're great books. You, um, you, you definitely have to subscribe to, to nutritionfacts.org, nutritionfacts.org with Michael um, Gregor, Gregor mm -hmm. and listen to, his pot, listen to his stuff, read his, 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 um, his blogs, and you'll naturally just constantly be learning good stuff. That's one thing. So the second thing is get the books, Furman's book, Eat to Live, and others that he has, uh, Michael Gregor's book, How Not to Die, How Not to Diet. Um, uh, then you could get books like um, the president of the uh, uh, Physicians for Responsible Medicine. Um, his name is blanking on me now, but he's written several books. Okay. okay. Brilliant writer. Um, and a lot of these guys, you'd think they're Adventists when you hear them talk about the health message, and none of them are, mm. which is pretty shocking. Um, and then there's other great ones like Dr. Schloth. Oh, he's an Adventist pulmonologist out at Loma Linda. Okay. Uh, he does some great stuff on his programming. Um, so those are things, but you got to read those things and and listen to those, you know, listen to the po the, the podcasts and the books if you can on, audi on Audible. But most importantly, always go back to making sure that everything you do in health is based back into Scripture. So studying the Bible relevant to the issue you're addressing, studying the spirit of prophecy relevant to the issue you're addressing. What I have found is that as once you understand the historical context in which Ellen White wrote. And you understand the times in which we live and the science where it is now, Ellen White dovetails perfectly into what's going on. Like I said, a lot of people say avoid medicine. Ellen White talks about avoiding medicine. They were still using like cyanide, like doing bleeding people and stuff back then, crazy stuff. So she was right. But just understand, if someone gets cellulitis or they have like sepsis, they need antibiotics today. So, you know, to tell people they don't need, you know, don't need drugs and you're going to treat them some other way is not very smart because that's a short-term thing that they can treat and, and cure. Now, if someone's on high blood pressure medicine and they want to get off, yeah. here's an opportunity for you to go with them through the lifestyle changes of exercise, sleep, diet change to help them get off of those high blood pressure medications or at least use a minimum amount, but preferably, obviously, get them off of it. Um, so you got to understand that in order to be wise. That's why, it's, you know, a lot of the folk, you know, I tell them go to medical school because once you understand how medicine works and how what the medical system does, when you take our principles now, you know how many people you can help because you understand the goal in the medical world for physicians. You now can circumvent that because you have things that you can offer people that are safer, less expensive, and more preventive. And if you combine that, you become a powerful force for God. Mm. Um, and that's physician assistants, that's nurse practitioners, um, that's nurses, nutritionists, right? You go, you, you train a nutritionist in the secular world, they're going to tell you, you the people need to eat meat and drink milk. Yeah. They don't, but you will now have that so that when they come to you, you can offer them something different. If you never go into these fields and we never get into the world like salt, we, there's a lot of people who will never be able to impact. I've reached hmm. so many people as a physician, I would never have reached preaching the gospel inside of one of our churches. Yeah. They yeah. come to me because they're having anxiety or bad dreams or headaches or whatever it is. And I can share these truths with them and ultimately share, share the Lord Jesus Christ and his goodness with them. Amen. Amen. 
Well, Dr. Walsh, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought. And I hope that for every medical missionary out there or anyone thinking of going into medical missionary work would simply devote themselves to, again, continually learning and expanding and and pleading with God to to increase your influence. You know, there's the prayer of Jabez where yep. he prayed, Lord, increase my, increase my, territory. my territory. And that's the goal. Always keeping in mind that drawing the souls to the kingdom is the target. And may God bless you in all that you endeavor to do. And remember, make the word of God your sure foundation.